everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction there, Eleanor. Um, this, this presentation came from an article that Robert Fears and I wrote, uh, presented for the Texas Southwest Association back in 2000 annual convention. And um, we've done it several times. And what we're really going to talk about is just a brief overview of, of of outdoor leases, this says wildlife leases, and all of them tie to wildlife, but they're outdoor leases, ways to diversify revenue potential on ranches and and um, help, you know, help keep land in uh, in our families and help the younger generations understand that there's uh, there's other ways to make money on properties besides just running cattle or doing, doing deer hunts and those sorts of things. So these are just general thoughts and um, <clears throat> And uh, ways we've seen uh, we've seen people uh, using their land. So uh, the the things to consider when we're when we're talking about leases are the type of lease, um, what your what your activities are basically, uh, the duration of the lease is it annual, is it a day lease, those sorts of things, and the pros and cons associated with the duration, different durations. Um, land assets. What does my land have to offer? If you're if you're interested in doing some type of lease. Um, the box um, and not just run deer hunts or dove hunts. What uh, what does your land have to offer other than those things? Um, the marketing. Uh, obviously, if you want to do something like this, it's become going to become somewhat of a business, and so you've got to be able to attract uh, clients. Liability is a huge concern, so we'll talk about the ways to uh, um, avoid some liability and ways to. Um, Make sure you're covering your family uh, and your property and your clients the best way you can. And uh, contracts are uh, very, very important with any type of lease. Uh, so the uh, the contractual documentation and the things we want in those uh, in those lease uh, lease agreements are very, very important. Okay, so uh, let's go through some types of leases. All of these may not be, some of these may not be relevant to your area uh, or it may not be even being popular in Texas yet, but all of these we've seen on operations uh, in our state and uh, and certainly across the country. Uh, and I think as the, the tourism aspect of, of, of land gets, uh, gets more popular, we'll start seeing uh, more of these, uh, some of these more obscure leases happening more often. Obviously we have hunting leases. Uh, fishing leases are very common in East Texas where we've got big private lakes. Uh, nature tourism, uh, a good example of nature tourism, if you're familiar with the Prade Ranch, they do a lot of uh, a lot of bird watching and hiking tourism, horseback riding and those sorts of things. Um, the Dude Ranches of Colorado, you know, do a lot of the horseback riding um, uh, sort of equine uh, tourism sort of uh, events and it's very popular, something that we could definitely do here in Texas. And so we'll go through uh, go through those a little bit more in detail um, <clears throat> here in just a little bit. So hunting, obviously, this is the one we're all most familiar with: uh, white-tailed deer, mule deer, uh, turkey, dove, quail. Uh, the the hog uh, hog leases have gotten very popular uh, because landowners um, feel the need to try to get rid of their feral hog populations or control them, and may not have the means to do it themselves. So we've seen a very uh, strong uptick in the uh, in the just pure feral hog leases where there's no other game involved um, in the last uh, several years, uh, and then obviously exotic ranches, um, exotic leases on uh, low fence properties in the hill country for axis deer, black buck, those sort of critters. Bird watching. Uh, this may not be one that you're um, hugely familiar with, but um, all along the Texas coast and in parts of the hill country, bird watching is a very popular lease. Um, usually it entails some photography, um, but there's lots of bird watchers that aren't photographers, um, and um, the uh, the leases are very diverse in, in terms of the structure of the lease. Most of them, I believe, are day leases um that, that they just charge for the for the day out on the ranch or for a weekend out on the ranch. Um I do know that a lot of the a lot of the folks on the coast will do uh morning and evening trips um and then the the lessees will wrap wrap in a fishing trip or some other type of uh type of uh, uh tourism uh in inside that uh, bird watching trip that they do. Um <clears throat> you can rent out equipment, you can do uh uh you know a, pamphlet with all the photos of the birds that have been seen so people can check these things off. Um, there's lots of ways to charge for other uh, for other things besides just the trip and these uh, and these bird watching trips. Um, you can seasonally market. You know in Texas we have resident birds in the in the fall uh, and we have we have breeding uh, migrating birds in the spring and summer and so there can be actually be two 
uh, sets of uh, trips for the same clients if they wanted to do a, a full year of, uh, of bird watching. There's there's a spring trip and a fall trip in there. Um, for independent ranchers, um, these are going to be your more nature friendly clients. So they're going to be uh, more cognizant as a whole of uh, leaving trash on the ground and and uh, driving in areas where it's muddy and running up roads and these sorts of things. So um, while you'll normally have a guide for a bird watching tour, um, your clients are going to be a little probably a little more cognizant of those sorts of things. Um, minimal landowner involvement, um, usually uh, on, on the ranches that we see doing bird watching and down on the coast for sure, they have a, an intern or a seasonal birder who will do the trips for them and for usually very little uh, little fee. Um, and so the landowner is not as involved as, as they are with uh, typical hunting type leases. No facilities required. Usually these folks aren't spending the night. Uh, they're they're going back to the hotel, having nice dinners in town, that sort of thing. So uh, usually you don't have to provide facilities and or negotiate a uh, construction of facilities like uh, we see on a lot of annual uh, hunting leases. Hiking, this, I want to say this is hiking and geotourism, again, usually in combination with other, other types of leases on properties. Uh, again, some of the, some of the larger ranches in, in the hill country, uh, do these sorts of, uh, rock climbing and, um, and destination leases where you're going to look at cave drawings or, uh, or springs or, uh, just a, just a nice cave, something like that. Um, I don't see a lot of these, but I know that they're, they're wrapped into other packs. Packages. Um, the horseback riding leases um, that uh, that are done are usually on large cattle ranches. Um, they usually have um, have some aspect of the cowboy lifestyle and participating in that sort of lifestyle. Um, you're going to have to be very vigilant about liability in these, um, about routing out the the, uh, the trips. Usually you're going to have some sort of uh, ranch hand involvement in those sorts of things. Almost always an overnight stay because people get dusty and dirty and they want to they want to get cleaned up. Um, and uh, and again, usually on large ranches you've got uh, you've got a big a route that these are taking uh, that these uh, clients are taking. So um, there it takes it's an all day trip usually, if not multiple days. Um, again, uh, we see these on large ranches. Uh, I believe the Nail Ranch, uh, or not the Nail, the uh, Four Sixes have done some of this for a while. Um, again, in Colorado, it's very popular as a dude ranch kind of setup. <clears throat> This is probably one of the more interesting ones. Uh, again, the Prairie Ranch, I know, uh, used to do a lot of this, um, and uh, some of the ranches on the coast do, do, uh, do a tremendous amount of just basically nature tours where you're just getting in a, you know, in an airboat or a flats boat or a, uh, in a buggy or on a horse or whatever, and you're going around and you're just inventorying the species that you see. There may be a plant list. There may be a, a, a sort of a scavenger hunt type uh, type setup where these folks are are just they're probably from out of state um, and they're just absorbing everything Texas has to offer. Um, they're usually pre-designed tours where you have signage um, indicating what plant you're looking at or, or the habitat type or some, some aspect of the diversity there. Um, the, uh, the, one of the, the guys that used to guide on the parade ranch told me a story of, of the, the, what he called gee whizzes. And these are just little three-minute tidbits on something that most people don't know. Um, and it may be some some mush, edible mushroom or some uh, you know strange um, uh, plant that they've never seen before, old man's beard or something like that, glowing in the moonlight. You know, um, just interesting tidbits that um, that that most people wouldn't wouldn't pick up on. Photography is always a big uh, a big plus um, for these tours, um, along with obviously birding and and uh, all of the historical information in the in the area. So. Um, this is a good way to get people out to get them um, interested in in all the aspects that the land has to offer. This is a great kid friendly type of tour um, again you're usually you're in some sort of vehicle so it's a lot safer than just walking around or riding a horse or something along uh, out on the property uh, it's very very good family oriented type of uh, type of tourism. And uh, people are willing to pay, you know, what they'd pay to go to Disney, to uh, Sea World, or to a zoo um, to come out to an actual ranch and and uh, be able to see uh, nature uh, in its native state. 
one of the uh, one of the benefits of this type of tour and this family sort of event is that you can usually get away with catering some meals and uh, and adding into your. Uh, not only is that added value, you get to you get to charge uh, that food cost, and they'll usually pay you know pay a premium for being able to eat out on the property. Okay, so there's just some general generic types of leases that we see. Uh, again just a broad stroke of, of what's out there and what might be possible. Um, so the, t the duration of the leases, um, most people are familiar with these, uh, day lease, packages, season lease, year-round or annual, uh, I'm sorry, and then, uh, and then sort of a combination of these things. So what I want to do is kind of go through the pros and cons. Um, there's, there's different aspects of these leases have different, um, different pros and cons to the landowner. Um, and so that's how we're going to approach this, is what, what's advantageous about these to the landowner and what might be something to consider um, as, a, as a negative. Um, the day lease, obviously, um, you have the, the uh, ability to have a higher revenue potential because you've got more clients. Um, now, that doesn't mean you'll be more profitable, but you certainly will have more clients on a day dove lease um, than you will on, a, on an annual lease where dove hunting is just part of the package. Um, so an example would be charging, you know, $125, $200 a gun for a dove lease, um, and you have clients coming out there Thursday through Sunday um, that uh, that are not the same folks every time, and uh, and you're you're so you're gaining a lot more interest and a lot more uh, revenue from different folks. Increased market share in these day leases, um, you're again working with different clients. Um, limited access, if you want to. Uh, if you want to shut down for a weekend, you don't have to lease the property that weekend. If you wanted to, I'm just going to use Dove as an example again. If you wanted to Dove hunt yourself on the third weekend of September, then you don't have to lease it out. You don't have an agreement with people that say that they can come on just about any time they want. Some of the cons increase liability. Uh, you don't know the people that are hunting on your property very well. So there's there may be some chances for, and I don't mean legal liability necessarily uh, as much as just the chance for something bad happening that you're not in control of because you don't know the people quite as well as you would on an annual lease or a season lease. Decreased privacy. Uh, if you're going to do day lease in earnest, uh, you're going to want to do it as much as possible. So you're going to you're going to lose uh, the use of your land uh, in a concentrated way. Uh, over short periods of time, like like in the Dove situation, property management concerns. I alluded to the fact that your your bird watchers and your nature tourism folks may be a little more cognizant of appreciating and protecting the resource than than some of your hunters might be. Well, um, if people are only out there for a day, um, they're going to be less concerned about trash, rutting up roads, picking up their shells if, if they're dove hunting or quail hunting, those sorts of things. Then an annual lessee would be, that, or a season lessee would be, that knows that they have to answer to the landowner um, and uh, and uh, have that conversation later on. So um, that's probably in my mind one of the biggest cons is you just you don't really know who's there, you don't really know how they're going to take care of your property. Uh, and it's not worth it if you have to go pick up 500 shell casings after every weekend. So uh, that's a big one to, to think about, and there's ways to mitigate that, um, but that's definitely something to consider. So the package lease. Um, this would be a, a, a lease where um, you would um, have a, a, a short term, you know, usually for a season maybe, and the, the hunters would be able to take um, – say dove and hogs or um, or deer and turkey in the fall uh, without going into the spring. Usually a little shorter term lease and just includes a certain number of animals. Um, we see this done where um, where the where the ranch owner has a uh, uh, a group of say dove hunters or a group of uh, uh, bird watchers and they don't want to be conflicting with the hunters so the bird watchers come in and they do their thing and there's no bird hunting and and uh, and no none of that so it doesn't conflict with the deer hunters uh, or the hog hunters so um so it's a very specific type of lease i don't see it done a whole lot anymore uh, there is high profit potential with any of these longer term, you know, season type leases uh, because you've got uh, less less involvement on your end in marketing and those sorts of things, less cost than a day lease. Increased privacy over a day lease uh, simply because these folks are not going to be out there every day. Uh, they're going to be coming on the weekends, that sort of thing, more like a season or annual lease. 
decreased liability for the reasons we discussed earlier. You know these people a little bit better. You've gotten a chance to interview them. Um, some of the cons, though, you're, you're, you are going to be involved in, in, uh, in getting to know them and spending some time with them. Um, your marketing may decrease a little bit, but your personal time on the lease may increase somewhat. Usually requires some facilities. Um, if people are going to come out for the weekend instead of for a day, they're going to want somewhere to stay. So either they have to build some facilities or, uh, or get water piped in, drill wells, have electricity on site, something like that. Um, or it's uh, up to the landowner to provide those facilities at a, usually an additional charge. I think the same property management concerns probably exist in a package lease simply because they're still a, a relatively short-term type of lease, uh, and uh, and the, the folks may be a little bit more cognizant of what's going on, but, uh, but you still don't have a long-term relationship with these folks. That long-term relationship starts to build when you get into the season leases. Um, the season leases, I think, are interesting because you can you can section them out, and you could have a group of of uh, bird watchers in the spring and fall. Um, you could have some some hiking, you know, during the during the warmer times. You can have the horseback riding, but you can also uh, have uh, have your normal hunting leases coupled with all those things. So you can have a group of deer hunters for the season. You can have a group of dove hunters before them for the season. You can have a group of spring turkey hunters for the season. Um, and it gives you some flexibility in not only your marketing, but uh, the duration of the leases. Uh, if uh, the property is not set up for long range rifles, um, you can do a season lease for bow hunters. You can do a, a, a shotgun only, um, you know, type turkey hunts and those sorts of things. So, um, it gives you a little more flexibility. You're able to develop a little bit bigger, uh, better relationship and long-term relationship with these folks. Most of the time we see the seasonal lease guys uh, renew their leases um, if there's quality animals be, to be had or quality, you know, uh, entertainment to be had. And uh, it's not something that they just do one year and move, move on. Um, there's the lease duality I was just talking about um, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, seasonal leases uh, sort of overlapping with each other. The reason I say decreased land in, landowner involvement in these season leases is because as you establish a relationship with these folks, you don't have to spend quite as much time around them to make sure things are happening the way that they, the way that you think they are and um, or think they should be rather, and your marketing um, costs go way down after you find a group that you think is going to keep renewing season after season. Uh, we see lots of out hunting outfitters. Uh, sort of incorporate this into their business where they're not actually outfitting a property uh, but they are uh, they're, they're they're booking the lessees for the landowner they may be providing feeder filling and, and that sort of thing but but they're really just overseeing that season lease for the landowner that happens a lot in whitetail leases and in, in across the state so you can choose when you want the land to yourself you have privacy during those non-lease times uh, it, it it's it's almost um, the same with an annual lease, except for you know these people can't come out any time they want throughout the year. You know they're going to be there during turkey season, for instance, but then they're going to be out, and you can control that. So it's just a step down from an annual lease in terms of uh, in terms of privacy. It also doesn't lock the landowner into a multiple year lease. Uh, a lot of times in an annual lease, uh, which we'll talk about next, the lessees want to put some some capital into the land, uh, and um, but they want a long lease period uh, in exchange for that. So with a season lease, you are going to renew every season, and uh, and there's less chance of of the landowner being locked into a long contract because of uh, because of the uh, involvement of the lessees. With a season lease, I think there's there's less property management concerns, uh, but they still exist. Um, they still exist with with all of these leases. Um, and uh, and really, that's about the only that's about the only con for the season lease deal. It's a very favorable lease package for the landowner, I believe. So, uh, one of my favorites to see done, uh, and it also diversifies your uh, your your the way you're using your land and the way you're managing your your land. So, that's a good one. So, the most I guess the most prevalent kind that we have in in uh, in Texas in terms of hunting, at least 
are the uh, are the annual leases. And again, as we kind of progress from the day lease to the annual lease, we rule out some of those, you know, more obscure horseback, you know, riding, hiking, those sorts of leases are more fitted for day use uh, or even seasonal use. And, and these these longer term, you know, season lease and annual leases are much more fitted to uh, to uh, hunting type leases. So I'll I'll my verbiage will change into more of a hunting uh, hunting uh, sort of example here. I think you probably got the highest profit potential, maybe not maybe not the highest revenue potential that probably exists in day leases, but the highest profit potential probably exists in annual leases. Um, I've been involved with management of, of of lots of high end annual leases in the last ten years, and um, if you've got the right property, you're going to be attracting uh, bigger money folks from large cities who from larger metropolitan areas who want to come out for the weekend. They want to spend Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's and Columbus Day and all of those holidays out on the place. Um, and they're willing to pay uh, a premium to be able to do that and to know that there's not going to be anybody else out there on the property. Um, and they're going to want to do that in a contractual on a contractual basis most of the time for more than a year. Um, if they're going to spend any money on the property or any uh, any of their own sweat equity on the property, they're going to want the, the knowledge that um, they they're going to be there for a while. But that also means that they're going to be more committed to the property. Uh, they're going to take better care of it. I've seen lessees build entire camps um, on properties that they knew they were going to be there for 10 years. They bring in, you know, I've one example of a, a lease I operate in, uh, uh, operated for a while in, in uh, Wilson County. Um, they brought in, um, you know, uh, double wide mobile homes. They set up nice pads for the mobile homes. They they kept care of the yard. They built a big barn and game care facilities. And all of this is the ranchers. Um, Equipment once the once the lease goes awry or or, um, or ends for some for whatever reason, but the but the lessees feel committed that they're they're going to get the use of that of all that those hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital expenditures and sweat equity back um, in security. You really get to know your your lessees on an annual lease. You, most of the time, the landowner becomes somewhat friendly with the lessees. You know they're welcome. The landowner is always welcome in camp, in my experience. Um, you really get you really form a trust with the with the guys that you're uh, with the guys and the families that you're uh, dealing with. I think this is probably the only type of lease where you can honestly say that you don't have as much property care concern. Uh, as you do with with uh, the other types of leases, because there is some commitment there, and there is a, a relationship being built there. Again, it can be an annual lease that's renewed every year, um, or you could take advantage of some of those uh, some of those pros with the, what I call the tenant for years basis, where you where you lease it for five or ten. I've seen this done for twenty years before. Um, so that that particular lease I was talking about in Wilson County just renewed a ten year contract, and they've been there for seven, I think. So that's seventeen years that they know they'll be there, um, and most of their kids will be out of college by the time that this next lease is up. The annual leases leases do involve a lot of landowner commitment. Um, that means that they may have to cost share some of these things that the lessees want to do on the place. They may be um, they may be around camp a lot more they may be required to uh, hire a ranch you know some sort of personnel to to help coordinate um with the lessees um if the if the landowner still recreates on their ranch at all then there's a commitment to not being um in the lessee's way uh, and so that can be a major concern uh, for not necessarily privacy but just the use of your own property um there is a, a definite aspect of decreased privacy um, there are um, there are concerns where you know you you don't have any real control unless it's written in a contract of any of the the days of the week or the weekends a, a lessee might be there. Um, generally, you're going to be notified when somebody's in camp, but it's really not up to you, and um, they can come whenever they want. <clears throat> Again, you may have to you may have to. Uh, uh, create some sort of system where you have one of your own uh, your own personnel uh, monitoring the activities there. Um, the what I mentioned about the 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 equipment and the and the capital and the infrastructure that these folks may set up. Um, while that can be a very good thing, um, it can be a it can be a detriment in the long run as well. 
um, all of those all of those uh, sing single wides and double wides I was talking about that they set up down there in Wilson County. Um, well, they're going to be there, um, and they're going to be there for a long time. So if the lessees leave and maybe you don't release the place, then you have to figure out a way to utilize those or they'd have them moved or something like that. So um, the equipment can be a very good thing. The infrastructure can be a great thing, but um, but it can also be something that you just need to consider in the long term. What's going to happen with that, that infrastructure in 10 or 15 years? So I've already alluded to some of this, but um, but these combination leases where you're where you're leasing different seasons, day hunts, all those things, it's a really good way to do it. Um, it's a it's a it's a very uh, you know it's a very intensive way to do it. You, you'd almost have to make this your halftime job to be able to put put leases together that way. Uh, but if you're really wanting to maximize uh, the revenue coming into a property for for hunting leases, or maybe you're wanting to give your you know your just out of college uh, uh, kid or grandkid something to do and, and you know they want to operate something like this it'd be a good way to do it but it's going to take some some time so um, the the combination of various leases um, is a again it's a way to maximize revenue but it's very time intensive as well all right so let's talk a little bit about about the land and what you need to be thinking about um, as we talk about these some of these more obscure leases like the geotourism and the, and the hiking and all of those things, a lot of times landowners haven't considered that somebody might just want to come out to their property in a hike or, or walk around or, you know, or drive around some of the, some of the different features. But we do see that people will pay to do that. It's again, it's not as popular in Texas as it is other places, but I think that will change. Um, and it'll change with the, uh, as, as generations of, of people get more get more and more disconnected with the land, um, they'll be more and more willing to pay for that reconnection. And so uh, what we want to be thinking about, uh, water is a huge component of this. If you have live water or a big lake on your property, um, that's a big piece of this puzzle. Um, plant life, you know, uh, obviously is important, different kinds of habitats that you have. Um, if you've got if you've got any kind of endangered species or say you're in South Texas and you've got a lot of the of, of the exotics that occur down there uh, or maybe in the, the Western Edwards Plateau, if you've got different uh, different species there than occur naturally. Um, the history, um, when we talk about the, uh, the, the bird watching leases, uh, for example, uh, most of these folks want to go watch birds during the day or maybe in the morning and then in the afternoon or, or the next day they want to go out and go to a museum or tour a city that they've never been on or go to the Riverwalk in San Antonio or one of those kinds of things. So incorporating something in your marketing and something in your information about history uh, and thinking about this yourself, learning about the history of your area yourself um, is a really good way to uh, to add value to the lease the, the lease that you're advertising or the lease, um, you know, Maybe you think, well, nobody's going to want to come do just this. Well, maybe they'll come do just this and pay you for it, and then they'll go do something else. You just have to be aware of what, your, what those opportunities are in your area. Obviously, Texas is a cultural mecca, so when, you, when you're thinking about these, uh, these types of, uh, you know, added values um, or value add um, and tourism opportunities, uh, be thinking about the, the – the San Antonio or Houston rodeo, or the best barbecue restaurant in your, and you know, if you're in, if you've got a big property in Caldwell County, you want to do a hunting lease on, be sure to tell them about, about all those barbecue spots down there, and those those sorts of things. It seems simple to us, but um, but the folks that aren't used to being you know, out on out on these ranches or not used to these small towns, um, or some of the attractions in the larger cities. They may not have thought about the fact that, oh yeah, I do want to go do that because I can do that and then go go take the family out and go do these other things. So I always recommend that that folks get some some professional or at least knowledgeable help, and you may be good enough at it on your own property already to to compile um, a, a little report for yourself about what I can offer. And it can go from the most generic things of here's the types of habitat we have on this property to very, very specific things like geological interests. Um, there's, you know, if you're in West Texas, there's lots and lots of caves and, um, and uh, 
water features and that sort of thing that are more rare out in those areas. Um, and, uh, you know, Indian mounds, all that sort of thing is interesting to people. And, and, uh, so compiling yourself a, a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, and sort of an internal marketing piece, if you will, to get familiar with your own property from a different perspective, uh, is always a good idea. You can hire this done. Um, but you, you know, most people that have been on their properties any length of time at all, um, are, are aware of some of these things, uh, but it still may help to have an outside, uh, an outsider's view on, on your land and what it can offer you. Okay, so talk about marketing a little bit. Um, there's lots of different questions that we ask when we want to market any product, um, but marketing a lease is pretty uh, is a pretty new idea to a lot of people who are thinking about this. Um, so let's talk about who you're marketing to. Who's your target audience? Where do they come from? Uh, odds are your neighbor is not going to want to come bird watch on your property, so you're probably not going to you're probably going to market to them uh, for that. Your neighbor might be the perfect hunting lease candidate. Uh, who knows? But you need to figure out who your target audience is. For a lot of these leases, these are going to be metropolitan folks that want to come get away from town, get away from the city, and go do something, whether it's for a day or, or lease a property for a, whole, for a whole year. Again, your neighbor's probably not going to lease your property for bird watching because the same birds exist on their property, given similar habitat, obviously. Uh, who's the competition? Um, I know around Uvalde, uh, in particular, there are lots of bird watching leases because Uvalde has some uh, some uh, areas of the of the county and that in that city in particular, um, one of their sewer treatment facilities that is one of the biggest birding meccas in the state. Um, and you don't know that if you're a birder, if you're not a birder, but um, but the competition there does exist. So if you're going to have a bird watching facility in Uvalde, you need to know who else is uh, who else is selling that and, and how they're selling it and why they're selling it and who they're selling it to. Again, a, some sort of internal survey about what are the marketable traits of, of our lease. Uh, what is our target audience demanding? If you're a if you're a wanting to market to dove hunters. Um, what are they expecting out of the lease? Do they want you to, to plant food plots for them? Do they want to do those things themselves? What can you advertise to make that more feasible and more attractive to them? Um, <clears throat> a big deal here that I've already alluded to is what can you market that you don't own? Um, what can you market that you don't have to spend any money on? Uh, local attractions, history of the area, those sorts of things, local restaurants, that's a big deal for uh, a lot of these day and season lease folks. What medium is the most effective? Um, obviously, the internet, social media is a huge deal. A lot of these lease, a lot of these lessees are are 50 and under, um, so you're marketing to people who are familiar with, you know, they've got they've got iPhones, they're familiar with Facebook and Pinterest and LinkedIn and all these sorts of uh, media that you can you can use to market your lease and not spend money on, you know, print ads and flyers and and newspapers and things like that. Should you offer any type of merchandise? Do you have a bird watching tour? Should you offer uh, Should you offer any sort of collateral to go along with that in terms of a checklist or a photo book or you know anything like that? Oops, sorry. So uh, this is very clear, but um, if you're if you're marketing dove hunts, I see a lot of people will start doing that in August. Most people have arranged a place to go hunting um, on September 1st um, as of August 1st. So you need to market these kinds of things in the summer when people are thinking about it, when your skeet shoots are all happening, and you know, people, are, people are having fun around that sort of activity, you need to be marketing those things then. Of course, you should do a big push at the, later in the year, um, closer to dove season, but um, if you're marketing day leases, um, it's a, probably a good idea to do it um, before the before your competitors have uh, have taken up that space and and gotten some of that market share. Um, when is your product available? Uh, I guess a good example of this would be: Is it worth getting a if you want an annual lease and a out group of of wealthers from Houston? Say, is it worth going ahead and getting the Maryland Lands Deer Permit uh, going on your property so you extend the time uh, that they can use the property? Instead of hunting three months now, they can hunt for almost five. Um, so when is it available? Affect that time frame at all to make it more attractive. Uh, 
again with uh, with how they're reached, um, where do they live, um, what uh, what specific zip codes even um, do they come from? Uh, these things can be found out by talking to talking to other landowners in the area, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the the leases east of taken up by Houston guys, leases south of Antonio are taken up by Antonio guys. Just a, it's just a very uh, a very a varied interest depending on where your property is located and and who's going to be using it. Um, annual lease groups are willing to travel, but usually, in, in my experience, usually no more than about four hours. From their, from their locality to, to where your where your lease is. So if you're marketing, if you've got a if you've got in Rock Spring, um, you might be better off in in uh, San Antonio versus Houston. Now some some folks will travel more than maybe they've got aircraft, but but I've seen that just just in, in brokering some leases and dealing with a lot of these lease groups, I've seen that the four hour uh, four hour drive time is a big ceiling for a lot of them. Some of them even say three, but it's hard for Houston folks to get anywhere with big properties um, in, in three hours or less. So uh, that's a big that's a big component of your marketing is is where do they live? So I'm not spending money marketing to people that can't even get to the place. You need to you need to build what I call a value proposition and uh, and tell the folks what you're offering and, and why it's why it's better than your competitors why it's better than other ranches that they could visit. Um, that 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 whole discussion in and of itself. But make sure you build you make sure you have an elevator speech and you can tell your 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 prospects what you're offering is best. Hey, all do some homework and figure out who else is marketing in your area. Um, and uh, and this probably is more uh, more easily done with nature tourism and watching leases because they market a little more heavily than the hunting leases do. Uh, but there are avenues to market hunting leases, finder.com or um, I believe. Um, TexasBowHunter.com has a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, if you have, if you're an Aggie and you have uh, uh, Tex Ags, um, that's a that's a really good place to find out who's marketing leases and what they're advertising, how much they're charging, all of those things. If you're really serious about this and you want to get into the lease business, you should ask yourself if you market your place efficiently. Can you do this? Are you a marketeer? And if not, it's per, it's probably easy easier to go find somebody that is, tell them what you want to do, and uh, and pay for a service that does that for you. Okay, just a little bit on liability. Um, it's a huge question in, in everybody's mind, and it's a more simple answer than what most people think. So the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, uh, Section 75, states, a landowner does not assure this is safe on his or her land by allowing guests. So, in other words, a landowner is not guaranteed that you, will, that you will be safe if you visit their property. That's written in code. They are not liable for a trespasser's safety. That should go without saying, but given the world we live in, it's in, it's in there, and that's good. And this is a very important one. If a landowner is no more liable for non-paying guests than for trespassing. Now, on my property, I have all of my guests sign a waiver. Um, I make a joke about it, and they sign a waiver, and, and we're all good. And I have to by an attorney. And, and But legally, I'm not responsible for their safety on the property um, anyway. Now, we take every precaution to make sure that everybody's safe and has a good time, but it's always a good idea to do a little CYA that everybody signs some sort of waiver. If you are paying, if you are having paying guests on your property, not liable for them as long as the fees do not exceed 20 times than the ad taxes. Get your tax bill, figure out what you pay taxes. If you're charged more than 20 times for those people to be there, then you need to have some sort of liability protection in place. You need to think really hard about you're going to secure liability, you need to have some legal counsel to do that. But you're not liable for paying gifts as long as they don't exceed three times more of their tax. So something you should always do if you're going to leave property out owned by a formal entity, not in your name. Um, have in, you know, three ranch LLC or 
you want to own it in. It's own operated thing. It's liability. It provides income bits because if you're getting you're getting paid an entity, you're not paying personal income tax on that. It's flowing through at the end of the day, but your CEO will help you out with some some ways to offer some of that it's under a LLC or gives a professional appearance uh, and market your and then it just create branch. It's 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 you know the braid ranch it has a little thing to it. Those are common in the LLPs the um LLCs. Our properties are held in L so those are their um vehicles in the LLPs. This type of uh, of it is more difficult to cover damage from the asset the, uh, if the ranch is owned in, in an L. Uh, this goes just an aside. If you own property at all that you it generally needs to be in a see, I don't care if you're leasing it or not, because you hit some freeway, you now became liable for a uh, person's injury. They can come out at all of your personal assets, include your ranch. Not in an LLC, it really needs to be there. Most of the time, will tell you that they'll live on the larger piece of land, um, don't necessarily have to be in, in that in that protect any uh, certainly any sort of, uh, any sort of property that, um, that way. He's responsible just if something happens in your lease, um, the responsible for he can lose their I mean, possibly that piece of property, but then to your personal. About income a bit. I always want to have legal counsel involved. I understand most people like attorney. Uh, they're very many sorts of things. We having some audio problems. I just saw that. So in liability uh, earns, uh, you can. Either charge less than twenty dollars the advalier and tax account, which limits them, or carry some liability insurance. Insurance companies throughout the state. I know Fulcher, a uh, Fulcher company in Fulcher, Texas. Uh, uh, they, uh, they 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 a good job uh, of this kind of liability insurance. Um, so uh, there are several companies that do that. That's one. Of those. Okay, let's contracts real quick. And we should be able to move to question. So you want to contract on every type of lease. And by contract, I mean lease agreement. You want some sort of lease agreement, any type of lease you do. If it's a lease, you you those hunters out there have somebody meet those guys out there and they sign a lease agreement and waiver before they start. Three less seats sign it. If a group comes and, and John says, Oh, I can sign a group, no. Three less seats has to sign the agreement. Every guest of those lists has to sign. The, the the leases that I've done in the past I had to sign a witness to be there working for them. You need to review the lease and the dates or review it every year. Uh, there needs to be fresh paperwork on an annual basis, regardless of what your contract for these lease guys thing is, um, things clean. What's included in the uh, in these lease agreements, and you can find copies uh, of sample lease agreements on the internet. Um, access periods, start dates. Um, when the, the setup is a, so in a, in a uh, seasonal, a lot of times they they, they want to come out before the season starts, um, so they can set up here and, and structures ready to go when uh, our deer feeders. Example, so they're ready for when the season starts. Activities are left. What game can you? Uh, what kind of can you take off the property? What kind of uh, photograph can you take uh, ranch? Those sort of things are uh, important to cover. The equipment allowed. Can you four wheelers? Uh, is it a bow of lease? Uh, are you allowing people to take photos? Uh, those uh, those sort of, uh, very simple, very important in the lease. Guess 
since we see this funding lease is how many how many gifts brought per go per person um are kids allowed to lease uh sorts of those considerations um vehicle allowances this is all the way down to identify whether roads and what roads be avoided during times um so those are those are extremely important on ranches that have just dirt roads and and you can do a big main bill if you're if you're tearing up every day. It's included um, and uh, continuing on these lease agreements. Camp safety, there needs to be a full paragraph on camp safety. Where the camp is, uh, if alcohol is in the camp at times, um, if a consumed alcohol, should they be able to go back out onto the ranch? Uh, all camps that I've ever been in have no loaded firearms in camp signs posted everywhere. Everybody's aware that you should unload your gun across the gate to the camp. Uh, transferability. Uh, if I can't make it these, this season, should I be able to transfer it to someone uh, uh, with landowner? Well, landowner rights. When can I use the, the lease for a certain activities during this period? Uh, these are very specific to individualized. Um, you make sure as a landowner that your rights are written out in that lease because you don't want your lessees to be angry with you if you're out during deer season driving around, but you don't want to you don't want to lose your religious just because it wasn't discussed. Record keeping can be a big deal if uh, if you've got a branch or a, a photography uh, lease uh, because you want to be able to use that data for a uh, market uh, or or keeping up with uh, how your partners are doing, make sure you're following the rules. If you're an MLD, you can have them do all the harvest logs of your data collection for you. It takes a lot off your hands. Again, use these, there's always be a, a, a path in there about resolution. If something happens, how are we going to fix it? How are we going to get together as a and, and partners and go into this thing and fix any problems that we're having? Okay. Um, it's time for questions now. Um, so I uh, was going to facilitate. Yeah, yeah. And your audio is uh, being a little strange. I don't know if it's um, an internet thing or if maybe your headsets, it's kind of breaking up a little bit. But um, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. So far, um, the only question we've had, someone has um, requested that you share a link to the article you referenced um, early on, I guess. You referenced um, an article. Yeah, I tell you, uh, if we could get a, if we could get some addresses, I'd be email it out. I don't, but it's on a yeah, published we website. Can do that. So. Yeah, we can we can send that out. Um, if you get that to me after the after the program, we can we can send that out to the to the people who have joined today. And if anyone else has any questions, please um, go ahead and post those in the chat window. Um, it should be available. Um, up at the up at the top of the panel on the right hand side panel, there should be a chat button. Just click that, and you can post any questions in the chat window. I haven't seen any other questions yet, aside from um, the one about the article. So now's your time. If anyone has questions, take a little bit of time. To make sure whenever you post the questions to do so to um, all participants, so that I can see it as well. I see a question from Chris uh, Jost. Hey, Eleanor, could you speak to any considerations for absentee owners that are leased to hunters on an annual basis? That may have only been shared with me. So one of the one biggest things for uh, for, an, for an absentee owner would be to have someone bring on site or make sure that somebody in that lease group you know and trust can monitor the activities. Um, I don't think you ever want to. Uh, I don't think you ever want to turn an annual group loose and and check on them once a month. Uh, needs to be some sort of monitoring of that. It can be a local, you know, that be a local high school kid or a or, you know college student, or you could you could employ an intern. There's all kinds of ways to get that done. Uh, but I do. Somebody needs to be monitoring that, or somebody at least needs to be on your uh, in your. Uh, on your team, so to speak. Okay, I've got a couple more questions coming in now. Um, we have a question um, on the 20X um, 
ad valorem is the total charge per person charge. Um, for example, each person on the annual pays 6000 but the total, um, if times five, would be 30000 which is 20 times the tax. My best, uh, best interpretation of it is we're going to have a contract with each individual in the group, so your agreement's going to be with the individual, uh, and that's going to require a path for each individual, not the entire group. Alrighty, we have another question here. Um, can you talk about parallel leases? Um, I have the hunting lease. Someone else has a grazing lease. Uh, good question. Um, so these, those types, of, those types of often collide, and, and sometimes in an unfriendly way. I'll, uh, I'll give a brief example uh, of a lease operation. It's a very intense lease operation in South Texas, um, but also has a very high hunting club uh, on the. The, the ranch and an annual lease with the group, and they they are constantly um, in sort of friendly banter about where the cattle are, when can I hunt, you know, certain things because the cattle are going to up my hunt, those sorts of things. Um, and I would say that the contracts need to be very, very detailed, to be very well written, and everybody just needs to be cognizant of the fact that the that the ranch is being used with duality, and you just need to explore conflicts. You need to make sure that you have a way, to, uh, a way to uh, uh, res resolve any sort of dispute that might come up. All right, and I just pulled up a different panel, and I've noticed there's been some questions. Uh, over in our Q&A panel as well. So again, if everyone could um, post those questions in the chat window, not the Q&A window, but for now I can go through and uh, and read some of these out. Um, okay, I'm, I'm seeing that we're still having issues. I've, I've sort of adjusted headset and I don't see anything that, that I'm, you're not doing. Um, yeah. We'll say that if we, if we, if we email address, I'll uh, I can pass some of these answers, I'm not getting them. So. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can definitely do that because, yeah, there's definitely still a bit of audio, um, almost like the audio is cutting in and out. I'm not sure if it's happening when I speak or not, but, um, yeah, I've noticed that on your end. Um, yeah, someone said they couldn't get the answer on the, the tax. Um, so, yeah, like like you said, we can, we can get some of these um, questions answered via email. I'll collect these and... Um, get them to Craig just because some of them were having a difficult time with the audio um, and get answers out to everybody and I'll continue to relay these to you and um, hopefully the audio will pick up but if it doesn't like you said we can we can get these answered um, via email as well so here's a question um, my neighbor has asked to lease my land to him to use as part of his or a uh, part of his leasing out of his land. Uh, specific issues for this type of lease. Uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. It says, my neighbor has asked to lease my lands to him to use as part of his leasing out of his land. So I guess. Oh, I got you. I got you. Uh -huh. So, um, so there'd be a, there would be a lease and a sublease agreement there. So your neighbor would sign a, a lease with you um, and then you would have to approve a sublease or a sublet uh, to have a subtenant in there and approve the, the lease agreement with that tenant. Just like if you're subletting an apartment. Okay. Alrighty, let's see. What, what are some tips for hunters on terms to include or avoid in a lease? Uh, from the hunter side of it, you want to you want the lease to be as broadly written, written as possible, and I would say the the main things are um, are the fact that you can use uh, you can use ATVs or, or UTVs uh, and vary your type of vehicles uh, because a lot of ranch owners don't like four wheelers to be used on a ranch, but it's very advantageous for the hunter. Um, the type of weapons that can be used. Um, some it's very popular now for lessees to only want bow hunters or to not want bow hunters at all. It's a very mixed set there. Um, so make sure that you 
you can use any type of weapon you want to use. Um, and uh, the ability to modify the, the ranch, to bring in your own infrastructure, to build uh, panels around the feeders, uh, the simple things like that that you, that you may want to do. Don't take those for granted that the landowner is just automatically going to let you do those things. Okay, I've got another question here. Uh, any requirements for smoke alarm, fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide detectors, and lodging? I uh, like the rules for traditional rent house. Yeah, there's there's no set rules for that um, in the in the codes, but I would say that any any sort of lodging you have uh, needs to be up to code because you can be liable for gross negligence. And if there's a gas leak or something like that and the house blows up and people are injured, um, you can be sued for gross negligence even if you weren't liable um, in, in the way the codes read about the Avalarum taxes and those sorts of things. Uh, you can still be liable if there's gross negligence. Okay. And just by the way, your, um, your audio is just great again. It's working just fine. So that's good. Um, we have another question here. What's the typical policy for yearly leases for the leases bringing guest hunters? Most leases that I see allow one to two guests per hunter uh, per year, so um, or sometimes per per hunt. Um, so you can bring a couple of guests if you want to, or maybe you know a husband and wife and their children. But you know you're not allowed to bring 15 guests at a time. Now, the higher end leases, the higher up the chain you go, the more liberal that rule gets because you want those guys that are paying, you know, fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year to be able to bring their their clients and groups and that sort of thing. So, uh, I know one particular lease that's got ten lease members, and oftentimes we'll have fifty or sixty people in camp, including kids. So, um, you want to give the person some flexibility as a as a lessee. Um, but you want to manage the numbers so that there's still that safety and, and uh, your, your property is still being taken care of. Okay. And then going back, um, just because the audio was really a little strange when you were answering the question about the um, Valorum tax, can you go over that just briefly again? Um, uh, yeah, the question, the, the question was, was, yeah, the question was that if it's a – a cumulative number for that 20 times ad valorem tax or if that's with the individuals. And my best interpretation, probably the safest interpretation of that, is it needs to be taken on an individual basis. Um, because likely, even if you have a group of lessees, you're going to have a contract with each individual, um, even if there's a blanket contract. So I would, I would interpret that as, um, again, I'm not an attorney, but I would interpret that as uh, per individual. All right, and I'm not seeing any other questions just yet. Um, so again, if you guys have more questions, please post those in the chat window. I do have a request to um, provide this site to the section of the property code that covers liability. So that's something else that we can send you guys in an email following this, this program. We can get a, a list of all the participants, all the attendees, and, and get you guys that, that property code as well as that article that was um, requested earlier. Not seeing any other questions. And um, by the way, thank you so much for joining us today and for uh, doing our wildlife for lunch and being our presenter today. So that has been super great. Yeah, I appreciate everybody attending and I hope, uh, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, definitely. Let me see. Oh, here's another question that just popped up. Oops. All right, here it goes. If you're leasing to a professional outfitter or guide to bring in hunters, how detailed should the lease be in regards to kids and safety, other things like that? Well, the kids are going to be ultimately the responsibility of their parents as long as there's no gross negligence involved. But um, detailing, if, if, if you're concerned about having children on the lease, there are certainly, there are certainly leases that do not allow children. Um, but the more detailed a lease agreement can be in any aspect, the better, the better off you're going to be as a landowner. Um, if you're just... If you're basically concerned about the kid's safety, you can have language in there that references the, the parental um, the parental involvement. Um, maybe that there always has to be a parent with a child under 16 if they're hunting in a blind, those sorts of things, uh, or, or out on the property by themselves. No children can drive vehicles unless they have a driver's license, that sort of thing. Um, but, but the more detailed you can be, the better. All right. 
someone else just posted if um, if y'all hadn't read this the Texas Farm Bureau has a sign for members that help in uh, the liability for agitourism to be posted on the gates of uh, buildings gates or buildings they do and, and the equine uh, equine law has a similar a similar sign about that um, and those are those are great but they are required and um, and some contractual um, and protection is, is a good thing so all right, and I'm not seeing any other questions. If there was a question that um, somebody asked that I did not um, cover, please just post it again really quick in the chat window. And our next, just by the way, our next Wildlife for Lunch will be on March 17th, and the topic of that program will be identifying predation on wildlife and livestock. And as always, this program will be posted online on our website as well. So if there's something you didn't catch, um, you can go ahead and, and find it on there. Probably within the next, you know, week or two it'll it'll be up on up on our website. I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. So here's one. Uh, as as the law now states, are there some aspects of liability that a guest cannot waive in a release you ask them to sign? No, not really. But just understand that a that a lease is only worth the paper it's written on most of the time. If something really horrible happens, um, you're never going to be able to fully protect yourself from lawsuits. You can just you can make sure you're protected from the outcome of those suits. But you may you may still be liable for uh, you may you, you may your liability still may be challenged um, even though even though you've protected yourself to the fullest. All right, and someone just asked the next um, the next wildlife for lunch. The next one is going to be on March seventeenth. It's going to be um, on a, on another Thursday in March. So, all right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Another call out again for questions if you'll have any more. And again, thank you so much for uh, for presenting for us today. And thank you everyone else for coming out today for our Wildlife for Lynch webinar. If y'all could fill out the evaluation that should pop up after the program, that would be very much appreciated. Also give us some feedback on um, some other programs you might want to view as well. All right, I'm not seeing anything else. Okay, well thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, I hope everyone has a great day.